true. If you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to turn to Ephesians chapter 6. That's where we're going to be today. And Paul begins his message, his section of Scripture, with talking about how we need to put on the armor of God so that we can stand against Satan's schemes. We've talked about how schemes are literally traps. It means to lie in wait, to expose the vulnerability of your enemy so that you can seize the opportunity. It means to set out a well-ordered plan against your enemy. And so we've talked about how God has given us tools to fight back. That yes, we win the war, we have the victory in Jesus Christ, but we each face our own individual battles. We each wage war against our own flesh and against Satan and his schemes against us. And we need to be wise and we need to be aware. And so a question that I would like for you to ask as you go throughout your day, as you go throughout your life, as you come into contact with different obstacles and different challenges, I want you to ask yourself this question. Who is my enemy? What has he planned against me? What does the Bible say? Do my Christian friends agree? And let me go and do that. I think too often when we come into contact with different obstacles or different challenges, we are so quick to react and allow our emotions to take control that we view the person in that time, in that moment, as our enemy. It happens in marriage. Husbands and wives argue against each other, and you view your spouse as the enemy. It happens in families, parents with their children, or children with their parents. It happens in the workplace, in the workforce. People do things that you don't like. And so you view them as the enemy. It happens when you have religious discussions. And this is one of the most sensitive areas. I have sat down and I have talked with people of all different religious backgrounds inside their homes, inside the homes of other people. Whether it's different denominations and Christianity or actually different people that belong to cults or people of totally different faiths. And every time I made the resolve that when I discussed theology or science or whatever it was with this person, I was not going to view them as the enemy. I was going to view them as the victim of the enemy because he is scheming and he is plotting against us. And so how do we fight back with the armor of God? And that's why Paul has this to say. We're going to pick up in verse 17. So far we've gone through the armor of God and we're going to pick up where we left off. Here's what Paul says. Here's how he concludes this armor of God passage. He says, as we talked about last week, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. That's what we're going to talk about today. And with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the spirit, which, with this in view, be on alert with all perseverance and petition for the saints and pray on my behalf, and look at this, that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains and proclaiming that I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. And so today we're going to talk about how we as Christians need to be able to preach the word fearlessly, with boldness. That's part of the armor of God. It's one of the only two offensive pieces to this armor that we're actually given. Everything else is a defensive piece of armor. This is something that we actually get to go on the offensive with. We get to start fighting back and taking it to the enemy, and it starts with the word of God. You know, Satan wants nothing more than for you to feel like the word of God is unreliable. He wants you to think that you can't trust it. It's some old book that's filled with fairy tales and stories that were passed on time and time again. And you even hear people say something like this. It's nothing but phone tag. One person said one thing, and then another person said another thing, and things changed over and over again. And you know what question I usually ask when I talk with people? How did you come to that conclusion? And nine times out of ten, zero evidence is provided. Because we have all of this rhetoric in our culture that the Bible is just some old book that can't be trusted. And if it's unreliable, right, then it must be also unrelatable. After all, it's old. It was written to people who are dead now, 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago. So why would I trust an unreliable and an unrelatable book after all, right? That is Satan's scheme, but we're told to put on the armor of God and take it to the enemy, and it starts with knowing the gospel. You know, I don't think there's really any better illustration that we could look to than Jesus Christ himself. 
Jesus decided to be baptized under John because it was the right thing to do. John's baptism is different than Jesus' baptism, which is what we practice today. John baptized for repentance. Jesus' baptism today is for repentance and the remission of sins, Acts 2.38. But Jesus was baptized by John to do the right thing. And then after that, he came up out of the water and he went into the wilderness for 40 days. And he didn't eat any food and he only drank water. And Satan comes along and he's trying to tempt Jesus And he walks up to Jesus and he says, Jesus, I want you to turn this stone into a piece of bread. And you know how Jesus responded? What weapon did he use to fight back against Satan's schemes? Well, let me show you. Jesus said this, it is written, the word of God says, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Tried to tempt him with food and Jesus said, no, here's what the Bible says. And then he tried to tempt him with power. The Bible says Satan took him up to the highest point on earth, which at that time is the Mediterranean world. That was the known world at the time. They didn't really know about countries in the Americas, which is what we live in today. Um, They weren't yet exposed to the Chinese culture. And so he metaphorically took him up to the highest uh, mountain on earth, and he exposed all the kingdoms. And he says, look, I'll give you everything if you will just bow the knee to me. And how did Jesus respond? With the word of God. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. He says, why don't you just throw yourself down? God's angels will help you. And he says, no, this is what the Bible says. And again, Jesus responds, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And then look at what happens. The devil left him and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Three separate attacks with three different points of pressure in Jesus' life. And every single time Jesus responded, here's what the Bible says. It was relevant and dependable for Jesus then. It is relevant and dependable for Jesus and for us now. And so here's the challenge this morning, brothers and sisters, we cannot fall into the temptation that the Bible is unreliable and the Bible is unrelatable. We need to look at the evidence and build our trust and fight back with truth. And you know what the devil's greatest weakness is? It's when you decide to fight back. It's when you become aware to his schemes. It's when you see things as they are. Who is my enemy? How is he scheming against me? What does the Bible say? And do my Christian friends agree? I like what James has to say in James chapter 4, verse 7. He says, submit therefore to God and resist the devil and he will flee from you. And so if you are experiencing spiritual attacks, if you are at war in your home, if you're at war in your job, if you are feeling attacked and schemed against by Satan, just in the temptation of your flesh, the Bible says, take out the sword of the spirit, speak it to him, speak it against him, memorize it, put it in your heart and in your mind. The psalmist writer put it like this in Psalms 119, your word is a lamp unto my feet. It is a light unto my path. It shows me the way to go. Peter had this to say in 2 Peter. He says, the word of God which was proclaimed in the prophets long ago has been confirmed to us and it shines light in our hearts. It exposes the darkness. Here's one of the reasons why Satan wants to get you out of God's word is because the Bible says when we look into the word, we see ourselves as we truly are. And it proclaims two essential messages. You know what those messages are? You are a sinner. You are a sinner. You've done things that are wrong. You've messed it up. There's no possible way you can get yourself out of this situation. I've got really, really bad news for you, the Bible says. You have sinned and fallen short, and you can't measure up. But then it also has a second message. It's how God sees you. You are ridiculously loved. You can be saved. Even though you fell short, I will redeem you, I will save you, I will love you, I will be with you, I will never forsake you. I can buy you back and bring you into a relationship with me. And if I can cut you off from that message, I can make you proud and arrogant. I don't do anything wrong, I'm a good person. Nobody needs to save me. I don't need saving at all. And then I can cut you off from the message of salvation. You're forever lost and you're worthless. Go and do as you please. Whether that's hurting other people, helping other people, doesn't matter. You're cut off, you're gone. That's the scheme that is waged against us this morning. Let's take a step back. Who is our enemy? What is his scheme against us? What does the Bible say? 
Do my Christian friends agree? And so here's his tactic today. You, you, know, you want to know what he does in order to cut us off from today? Here's what he does. He wants to exhaust you. He wants you so busy working, doing things that just absolutely exhaust you. When I look at parents today, and I know, because you guys hear me all the time on Sunday morning, I get tired all the time, right? My kids are exhausting. But when I see parents who are the parents of teenagers, they are exhausted. They run themselves ragged. They say, Rick, look, you continue to be exhausted. It's just in a different way. Isn't that true, parents? What about for those of you who work? You work long hours, You're totally exhausted. The last thing you want to do is cook or clean when you get home. You just want to collapse in front of the TV and vegetate, right? Somebody feed me and let me watch something that's entertaining. I mean, we're exhausted all of the time. Food saturates our society. We overeat. We overindulge. All we want to do is lay around and eat. (laughs) And I'm like, amen, that's me. (laughs) His message and plan is to make us exhausted through any means necessary. And if he can't make you exhausted so that you don't read the Bible, he'll entertain you. How many of us have been watched movies, Netflix, social media, hours and hours, looking at YouTube videos, Instagram, Facebook? I mean, we are so overly entertained that the moment we try to pick up the Bible, it is so unrelatable, we want nothing to do with it. We're like, man, I got three verses into Leviticus, and it's been an hour already, good enough. (laughs) It's totally unrelatable. We have a highlight reel through the entertainment industry, and the Bible just seems like this weird, outdated book that really isn't relevant to us. It's confusing, especially if you try to be awesome and read the King James Version. I mean, you want to talk about something that's challenging, read the KJV and see how you fare out. You'd be like, I have absolutely no idea what the Bible says. (laughs) That is his plan. That is his tactic, to make you exhausted or entertained to where the Bible is not relevant in your life. When's the last time you read an entire book of the Bible in one sitting? You know how long it would take you to read the Gospel of Mark? Probably about 15, 20 minutes. You know how long it would take you to read an epistle like the book of Ephesians? 10 or 15 minutes. But we sit down and we break out a sweat after reading five verses. Too much, brain overload. And then I'm going to turn on Netflix for seven to 10 hours and eat ice cream all day. <laughs> That is our culture. Look, if you want to be depressed, you want me to show you how to be depressed? Don't read the Bible. Stay inside every day. Don't exercise. Watch TV. You will be the most depressed person on the face of this earth. Cut off sunlight. Cut off social interaction. Watch TV all day. Stay inside and eat terribly. This is the scheme. And so we're going to look at the fact that the Bible is not unrelatable. It is not unreadable, and it is not unreliable. And so I've got a little bit of information I'd like to give to you this morning. Whenever we approach something like the Bible, let's say the New Testament, we need to ask ourselves this question. If Christianity really is true, it should expose what is true about reality. It should give us things that are truthful, and it should give us things that are testable, right? I mean, if the book called the Bible is going to be anything worth following, it should tell us something about reality, it should speak things that are truthful, and it should be things, uh, it should have things in it that are testable. So if it talks about certain places at certain times, we should be able to go there and see that, right? If it makes certain statements like the earth is a globe or, or a sphere hanging out alone in space, when science comes along and it reveals to us the nature of truth, we should find something that reflects that truth. Uh, and so that's what we're going to do a little bit this morning. And there are three different tests that I want to take you through. The first one is going to be the test of accuracy, right? How accurate and reliable um, is the Bible? When it says things, is it accurate? Number two, the internal test, right? What does the Bible say about itself? If the Bible is supposed to be trustworthy in the, in the Word of God, it certainly should claim to be that. And so you often hear people say, well, the Bible never claims to be the Word of God, and that's absolutely false. And then thirdly, we, it, we should be able to confirm it, right? This is what we call the external test. What do outside sources say about the Bible? Do they confirm its truth or do they deny it? And so the first thing I want to tell you about is what's called a manuscript and what's called an autograph. And here's a little bit of information about the Bible, okay? First of all, it's got 40 different authors. Nobody sat down and said, I'm going to write the Bible today. It has been something that's been compiled by 40 different people over 1,500 years. There's a total of 66 books in it with three different languages on three different continents. And this is really relevant and really important when we consider um, the information that we have called the Bible. 
The autographs were the original documents written by the author. A manuscript is something that copies the original documents written by the author. We don't have any autographs today. And me as a Christian, my theological belief about the autographs is that they had no errors, right? They were completely free of errors. They were completely truthful and trustworthy. However, as time went along, we did develop errors in our manuscripts. Certain people wrote down things that were wrong. And before you get up here and throw a stone, I want to show you what I mean, okay? Now, the Bible was written in three different languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. This is important. Because nobody sat down and wrote the entire Bible in Latin or in English. And what's really interesting about these languages is they didn't evolve like the English language. For instance, right, there are certain words in the English language that has now has a new meaning today. Well, the good news about these languages is they're called dead languages. They didn't change. They didn't evolve. What we have in the manuscripts is what was written, in other words. And so, like, for instance, this is just a random word, the word fat. If I were to tell you that, you would think probably of somebody who is overweight. But through our culture, we've developed this word now. Fat actually can mean something that is cool, is neat, is appropriate. Now, that's from my childhood, okay? So you guys know what I'm talking about. But you guys know this. Words change in their meanings all the time. Not so with the Bible. Here's probably the best example that I can give you, the word baptism, okay? The word baptism in the Greek is baptizo. It always meant to submerge, plunge, totally immerse. Anytime you read baptism in the New Testament, think full body immersion, or if it says I baptize my hands, full baptism immersion. You go to the English dictionary today, baptism has taken on three different meanings. It could mean immerse, it could mean pour, or it could mean sprinkle. That's not what it meant in the original manuscripts. And so it's good news. It's good news because it means the language never changed. And so here's what we do believe as a Christian church. The original autographs of the Bible contained no errors, fallacies, mistakes. It's perfect. It's perfect. Now let me give you an objection, okay? And maybe you've thought about this before, or maybe you've heard this before. Here's the objection. Well, the Bible has changed so much that we don't know what was originally written. The Bible is just a bunch of myths and legends, and it was written far after Jesus died. Well, first of all, that's false, okay? That's false. Number one, the Bible was written by what's called eyewitness testimony. You guys know what eyewitness testimony is? If you were to appear in a court of law and you were to call in eyewitness testimony, how reasonable would that be for you to conclude that what you were saying was true? What's the best piece of evidence that you can give? More importantly, if you were to call in three different people who had eyewitness testimony of the event, now you're looking at a cumulative argument. Wow, look at all these people who proclaim to witness what actually happened, and it bears the weight of evidence. And that's exactly what we find in the Gospels. That's exactly what we find in the epistles. Luke, for instance, he said, look, I interviewed eyewitnesses. Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. First John chapter 1, John says, we were eyewitnesses. We touched him. We saw him. We heard him. We walked with him. I mean, all throughout the Old and the New Testament, these people proclaimed to be eyewitnesses of what they saw and what they recorded. And so the idea that the Bible was not written by people who were within Jesus' lifetime is absolutely false. But then there's more. If you look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, the Bible does proclaim to be the inspired word of God. All scripture is breathed out by God. Here's what that means. God spoke it. He breathed it out. And the method by which he breathed it out were the apostles, were the prophets. And so when we deal with this first objection, number one, The Bible was eyewitness testimony. But number two, the Bible was written way too early after Jesus Jesus died, and so it didn't give enough time for myths and legends to creep in. Look, if you give a span of 500 years, for instance, between somebody having an event occurring and then it being written about, you've got a lot of time in which things could change and creep in. Do you know how early the Christians developed what are called creedal statements after Jesus' death, where they began memorizing certain statements and passing it around? You know how many years they developed it after Jesus' death? Five years. The Apostle Paul was in Jerusalem five years after Jesus' crucifixion. Not 500 years, not 50 years, five years. That is 
very small. That is a very narrow window. They begin writing these things down 40 to 50 years after Jesus' death, and that's me being generous. There is speculation that Mark's gospel was written in 40 AD, which is only 10 years after Jesus' death, and he used a source called Q, which is in 10 years after Jesus' death, that time frame. These guys began to write down the Bible very early. Paul's writings between 40 and 64 AD before, before he died. I mean, we are only talking about a few years between the event and the actual writing. The mere idea that the Bible wasn't written until hundreds of years until Jesus died, after Jesus died, is a myth in and of itself. And so when you, whenever you confront people who have these types of ideas, you ask two questions. What do you mean by that statement, that the Bible was written hundreds of years after um, it actually happened? And how did you come to that conclusion? Do you have any evidence that matches up with what you're saying? And so when you look at this objection and you see these creeds and these autographs and these manuscripts, for instance, remember the difference between an autograph and a manuscript? An autograph is the original writing. A manuscript is something that's been copied. We have manuscripts between 20 and 200 years of the original documents being written. That's incredible. And let me show you why here in a little bit. When we look at this time span that I just showed you, right, you've got five years, you've got 20 to 50 years of the autographs, you've got uh, 30 to 150 years, 200 years of manuscripts, you begin gathering this cumulative argument that, wow, the Bible was actually written a whole lot earlier than what I thought, and here's why. Look at this. Has anybody ever heard of Plato? Yeah, yeah, it's not the stuff that you, you play with, right? He's a person. He's written some really important stuff. Well, there are actually manuscripts that we have of his writings. Not autographs, but manuscripts. Plato existed between 427 and 347 BC. His manuscripts are not um, found until 900 AD. That's a 1,200-year gap, and there's only seven of them. There's only seven. And yet, we take his writings as historically accurate. You consider somebody like Aristotle. He's another important figure. He lived around 343 BC. We don't have any manuscripts of Aristotle until 1100 AD. That's a 1400 year gap, and there are only 49 manuscripts. Well, we take Aristotle as historically reliable. You got Caesar, the history of the Galactic Wars. Between 100 BC and 44 BC, we don't have manuscripts until 900 AD. That's a thousand year gap. We only have 10 manuscripts and we take him as historically reliable. How about Homer? Very important piece of literature that he wrote between 800 BC and 100 and 200 AD is when we actually have um, these manuscripts. So he lived 800. We have them between 100 and 200 AD. That's a thousand year gap, 10 manuscripts, 10 historically reliable. Josephus, a Jewish historian, one of the most important Jewish historians ever to exist. He wrote a lot about Roman war. We get a lot of information. It's an outside resource about the Bible. He lived around 70 AD is when he wrote. We have manuscripts in 1000 AD. There are nine manuscripts with a thousand year gap, historically reliable. The Bible blows these things out of comparison astronomically. There are tens of thousands of manuscripts of the Bible between 50, 100, 150, 200 years after they were originally written. 10, 9, 7, thousand year gap compared to the Bible. Tens of thousands of manuscripts written within just a few years of the events occurring by people who proclaim to be eyewitnesses. The Bible has a lot of good evidence for it to be trustworthy, reliable. When you speak it and read it, it can actually mean something because it's what the original authors intended. Now, what about this question, right? Can you imagine reading a history book that didn't include 9-11? An American history book that was written in 2018 that excluded 9-11. If you were, let's just say you didn't know what year it was written. If you were to come across a history book, for instance, that didn't include 9-11, what would you conclude about that history book? Well, it's probably written before 9-11, right? Now, there were some big Jewish events that happened that are not recorded in the Bible. For instance, the destruction of Jerusalem. It was one of the worst events ever to happen in the history of the world. In fact, the Bible predicted it and said when it comes to fruition, nothing else will ever happen like it again. 
They crucified 800 people a day for hours and hours and hours. They ripped their intestines open because the Jews tried to swallow their gold to escape the city. And the Romans didn't let them. They killed them all. And then they got the gold out of their intestines and out of their feces that were on the ground. They murdered these people horrifically. They surrounded the city to the point where they starved them to death. Parents were eating their own children. That's how bad this was. And if that wasn't worse, there was infighting going on inside of the city where they were poisoning each other's food and water. It was a horrific historical event. And this was written, right, in history around 70, 80 AD by Josephus. It's not included in the Bible. What does that tell us about the Bible? tells us it was probably written beforehand. Imagine yourself a Jew, right? A Jewish Christian. Jesus actually talks about this in Matthew chapter 24. Imagine not including it in your writing saying, look, what Jesus had to say was actually true. That gives us really good information and really good evidence that it was written beforehand. The destruction of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple, the Jerusalem siege, everything is down. We also have the deaths of the apostles, for instance. The majority of them are not included in scripture. The majority of them died before 70 AD. What does that tell you about the time of the writing? Well, it probably happened before 70 AD. And so we've got all of this information given to us, all of this comparative information. And people say, yeah, I accept Plato. I accept Aristotle. I accept Caesar. I accept Homer. I accept Josephus, but not the Bible. Well, that's not fair. And it's not right. And it's not on the side of evidence. We've got really good information and really early writings that can tell us what we have is true. And so, as I showed you, these big events, these early writings, all of this information collects together to give us this really early testimony that we have here today. So here's the key phrase. It is reasonable to accept the reliability of the biblical manuscripts, which means I can trust them. When God says I should do something, I can know that some person didn't come along and change it to meet his own gratification and his own gain. When the Bible tells me to obey the plan of salvation, I can trust in the promises of God. When the Bible tells me that I am loved and I am cared for and I am died for, I can trust that what was written is actually true. Now, if I can get you to trust the Bible and I want to scheme against you as Satan, here's my new ploy, okay? Here's my new tactic. I want to make him a liberal or I want to make him a legalist. If you can trust that what the Bible says is true, I want to make you make everything myth and allegory, or I want to make you take everything legalistically rather than literarily. We've got certain books of the Bible which are actually pieces of literature. One of the biggest mistakes I see people make when it comes to the Bible is they take everything literally rather than literarily. Here's what I mean. Go to the book of Revelation, for instance. We're going to read it at the end of this sermon. Look at what the Bible has to say in the book of Revelation. One of the biggest mistakes people make is trying to literalize the book of Revelation. It's apocryphal literature. It was never meant to be taken word for word, dot for dot, eye for eye testimony. And so that is my ploy. I want you to make everything a myth when it comes to Genesis. I want to make everything legalistic. So you've got to pigeonhole yourself in one camp or the other, and it's a mistake. Satan is at work. Look, I've been preaching for almost 30 minutes now. How many of your minds are actually phased out? information overload. But can't we go watch Avengers for three hours and we pick up every single detail and talk about it and describe it afterwards? There is war being waged against us. Trust the Bible. It's reliable. How about objection number two? Men wrote the Bible. Men make mistakes and can't be trusted. Therefore, the Bible has mistakes and can't be trusted. That's absolutely false. How many of us have picked up a Bible written by a man and there were no mistakes found therein? Pick up a math book. Pick up a a, a book on history. We read books all the time written by historians and mathematicians and scientists, and they don't have errors at all. So just because men wrote the Bible doesn't make it filled with errors and mistakes. That's a uh, a subjective testimony about the Bible itself. So we can reject that, and here's how we respond to that. The Bible was copied too many times to allow for major changes. 24,000 manuscripts, multiple languages, It was written and copied way too much. Let me give you an illustration. My wife, Angel, loves Starbucks. Anybody else like Starbucks in here? Anybody else? Let me ask this again. Does anybody else like really crappy coffee? Anybody else? 
No, I'm just kidding. I actually do like Starbucks, okay? I do. We enjoy Starbucks. She enjoys it. One of the, our favorite things to do is to go on a date and we get Starbucks together. Uh, they just came out with this really delicious blueberry tea. It's awesome. I love it. But I usually get a venti Americano with cream, <clears throat> in case anybody wonders, okay? Venti Americano with cream. In other words, if you ever want to buy me coffee, that's what you can get me, okay? In case you didn't get that. So uh, what, what if I were to text the angel and I were to say, hey, meet me at Starbucks, okay? You ever mess up with autocorrect? and it changes your words. Well, let's say I misspelled something like, oh man, I got to do it again, okay? So I send her and I say, mob me at Starbucks at 5 p.m. Well, now I've messed up another word. Ah, got to send her another text message. Meet me at Starbucks at 2 p.m. Ah, I keep messing up. You ever do that? You just keep messing up? Now imagine if I were to do that 24,000 times. Would you be able to walk away with the right message? Yes, you would. Because what a critic does is he compares the information in the manuscripts. Oh, somebody changed the spelling of a word. Somebody left out the word and. Somebody left off the end of the sentence. But because it's been circulated and copied down so many times, you get to cross-compare the manuscripts and you can eliminate 99.5% of the problems. Here's what people say when the Bible's filled with errors. If you have an early manuscript written in 200 AD and it's got the word and in it, Okay, Kai, it's the Greek word. It's got the word and in it. And then the 10,000 manuscripts found after the one written in 200 AD does not have the word and in it. It will say there are 10,000 errors. Something so insignificant. If you were to strip away all of the errors in the Bible, okay, let's just say, let's rule out all of the errors in the Bible, you still walk away with the majority of the New Testament and the Old Testament without errors. So even if you say, okay, we'll just take out everything that has errors, you still walk away with understanding what was written. Why? Because it was copied so many times on three different continents. Response number two, well, the Bible's got errors. I've already explained that to you. These were scribal errors, okay? There are no major theological changes in the Bible at all. And so we've got two things when it comes to the manuscripts. We've got quality. There are too many accurate copies to say that it's false. There's just too many. And then we've got quantity. There are too many um, quantity uh, of these manuscripts, and it corrects all its mistakes. And this is really, really awesome. It's really, really good news. This is why we should support things that try to find more manuscripts, because all it does is confirm the testimony that we have in the Bible. So here's what's cool, right? You've got three major anchors in the church, Peter, James, and John. They each went and separated kind of into their own mission fields. Um, you've got Paul, you've got John, and you've got Peter, excuse me. And so they all wrote to their individual people groups. For instance, Peter's primary mission field were the Jews. Paul's primary mission field were the Greeks, right? The non-Jews, that's who Paul primarily ministered to. John really circulated throughout the entire known world at that time. And so if you can imagine people taking their manuscripts into their own individual errors, areas, and they're copying them, and they're sending them around, and they're circulating them, it makes it verifiably impossible for us not to walk away with what the authors originally intended. Even if Paul's section would have totally disrupted the word of God, we still have John and Peter's manuscripts to verify what was written. It's really good information. And so when Satan whispers to you, the Bible is... You can't trust it. It is totally unreliable. We speak back. We have an overwhelming quality and quantity of evidence that makes the Bible accurate beyond a reasonable doubt. It's reasonable to trust the Bible. And then finally, we look at the evidence outside the Bible. What, let's, let's just say, let's get rid of the Bible altogether. And let's see what other people have to say about it. Even more so, let's see what people who hate Christianity have to say about it, right? People who attempt to explain away Christianity. Do you know what we find? We find a ton of historians and philosophers and doctors and political officials and religious officials who've written about the Bible trying to do away with it. And by trying to do away with it, they quote it, they reference it, and they confirm it. And so here's what we get. Throw out the Bible. Here's what we get. Jesus lived. He was crucified. There was an earthquake with darkness at the point of his crucifixion. He lived in Judea. He was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He had followers who were persecuted for their faith, and he was wise and an influential man who died for his beliefs. 
The Jewish leadership was somehow responsible for Jesus' death, and his followers adopted his beliefs and lived their lives accordingly, despite having every reason on the contrary. Look, if anybody was in a position to find out whether or not Jesus was telling the truth or a lie, it were the disciples. Nobody dies for what they know to be a lie. People will die for what they believe to be the truth. But look, if the apostles stole the body of Jesus... Or if they lied about his resurrection and they were going to have their heads cut off, run through with spears, dragged through the city, nobody dies for what they know to be a lie. We have all of this information. We know that the first Christians believed Jesus was God. We know that the first Christians held a high moral code. All of this information about Christianity we can walk away with without the Bible at all. It's really good information. And we could just spend up all day up here, right? One person said Jesus had magical powers. He did. He was able to do stuff that nobody was able to do. This guy was special. Over and over again. And so here's the key idea, right? Even hostile evidence confirms the biblical account, which makes the Bible trustworthy. When 